Let me, I guess it should tell me. Oh, it says we're live. All right. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. We're, this is Techno Grand Fighters Forum, episode number 66. I'm Ramola D, and I'm here this morning with um, the whole crew, Dr. Catherine Horton from Switzerland, um, Dr. Millicent Black from Tennessee, and Karen Stewart on audio. And for some reason, I'm hearing an echo. So I wonder if that's because of my... Hold on one second, let me just fix this. <laughs> I think I've got a... Oh, there we go. I got that taken care of. All right, let me come back to the meeting. All right, sorry about that. Um, so anyway, um, okay. Just to say what we're talking about today, you know, one of the main subjects that we want to cover today is actual targeting, the actual assault of those who are being non-consensually, extrajudicially targeted and assaulted and enrolled into these non-consensual experimentation programs, the actual assault with um, directed energy and how intensely people are being retaliated against, both people who are ordinary citizens, community activists, journalists, whistleblowers, um, you know, and, pe and well, people who are ordinary as well as people of prominence, you know, in the community who are being targeted and assaulted, they're being targeted and assaulted extremely. So we're here today to talk about extreme retaliation, extreme assault, extreme abuse. And we're here to raise the question before the entire world community, um, is it right, do you think, that anybody is assaulted in this fashion? Do you think it's right? Do you think it's um, something that we can condone as a species and as a community? And what do we think about it and what are we going to do about it? So that's our big question facing us today. And we'll talk about various other subsidiary issues around that. Um, so if people are joining us for the very first time, again, I should just say we are a group of human rights activists who are here to speak out openly and have a public conversation about surveillance abuse, about non-consensual neuroexperimentation that's currently ongoing around the world, and about non-consensual weapons testing being directed at civilian populations by large defense contractors working for the US Air Force, the US Navy, the US Army, the US military, and um, the US government and literally other governments, uh, militaries and intelligence agencies as well around the world. So no doubt in congruence and in agreement uh, through NSA agreements, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if people haven't heard of directed energy weapons or electronic warfare weapons, this is the time that you need to wake up and understand that there is in place around the world an electronic concentration camp, literally using satellites, cell towers, drones, land-based platforms, ground-based platforms, mobile platforms, you name it, neighbors and houses, portable weapons, um, modified car, uh, cell phones, modified car, car handles with hidden uh, emitters and transmitters and whatnot, stealth antennas, covert repeaters. You know, this is the language of clandestine tradecraft and it's the language of the US Navy because these are the guys who uh, invented this ghastly weaponry. They've got it all around the world now. It's definitely all around the US. We are in a massive concentration camp and it's not just a small handful of people who are being targeted. Everyone potentially is being targeted and everyone is already being targeted. So, you know, we are here to speak openly about that and to alert humanity to the horror of what is going on and alert humanity to the necessity of needing to do something about it very soon or immediately, really. So with that being said, um, you know, we can open our conversation today and we can talk about retaliation. I'm especially interested in talking about retaliation against whistleblowers, particularly whistleblowers that I have podcasted with um, and uh, retaliation against journalists, AKA myself for having podcasted with these whistleblowers apparently and having written about these whistleblowers apparently because I have been massively hit lately and I'm really tired about it died off it and I want to speak out about it uh, very openly and I want to let people know what happens every time I do a podcast or write an article and uh, you know I want to show you those articles and podcasts so that people can actually watch them and read them because I suspect they're also being you know emasculated on the internet so because uh, I'm trying to spread some information and truth out here so anyway 
I'll um, stop ranting for now and I will <laughs> turn the floor over to um, either Catherine or Melissa to Karen. Karen is joining us on audio today. Again, she's recovering from an ankle injury, so she'll be in audio. So whoever wants to jump in, I know we have a lot to talk about. Um, No one? Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I want to talk about um, retaliation that I've been having in the form of taking over my electronic devices. And when I say taking them over, I mean, right now they're being controlled. My cell phone, as well as my tablet are being controlled, whereby they're not being allowed to um, recharge the battery any place but at home. I can have my uh, charger, which includes the AC um, part of that packet, have it plugged into a wall. I've had it plugged into a wall at a doctor's office, at a library, at another uh, business, and they were not charging at all. Uh, so what that says to me is when I leave home, and even if I have a full battery on both uh, devices when I leave home, the, the batteries can be drained and not allowed to be recharged, not even in my car. That's extreme control. It is also extreme cyber stalking, considering the fact that I could be in Alabama, I could be in Nashville, Tennessee, or I could be in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And my ability to have communication via electronic devices will be being controlled in that manner. One thing that AT&T told me about the, the, the devices is when you begin having such uh, interference, feel it. And, and if it's hot, she says, you can tell when someone else is in your device because it's always hot. And that is heated to the touch. That means that someone is, is externally invading your device. So... For those of you who have also had weird things happening to your electronic devices, that may be it, but cyber stalking, cyber hacking is indeed a federal offense. And that's something that we should actually begin to push. Being a federal offense is something that means also that it's something that we can report to the FCC. I've reported my uh, cell phone being taken down to 911 calls only, and then I wouldn't be able to make a 911 call but that also made it an FCC matter. So I filed a complaint. Uh, the FCC contacted AT&T and told them to, to get back in touch with me about it because it is actually interrupting my service. When AT&T called me back, and this was October, uh, August, 2012, she told me um, that she, they had been instructed by the FCC to contact me. And she said to me of the person who I've been reporting over and over and over, she said, he is destroying your life. I says, what do you mean destroying my life? Then why can't you do something? She said, our hands are tied. But the point is they know that their devices can be hacked into. Another time my device was, uh, was hacked into my cell phone in that every time I placed a call to a certain number, I knew of and still do know of another woman who is a victim of organized uh, stalking and electronic harassment in this area. Every time I would place a call to her sister, the call would go automatically to a, uh, an automated voice message. So one Sunday, I saw the woman that I'd been trying to reach. I asked her about receiving my call. She says, I, I haven't received any. So I called her number and let her hear the voicemail. She said, that's not mine. My voice message has my voice on it. So then she called her number from her phone. And indeed, it was her voice on the phone. Together, we called AT&T to uh, report that my calls were being rerouted to a um, to a bogus voice message system. And the only thing he could tell me to do was actually delete that phone number from my phone and enter it in again, because that particular link, he said, was being directed to a bogus number. Again, cyber stalking, cyber hacking, a federal offense, supposedly. Um, it's been quite frustrating. The most frustrating thing though right now is 
not being able to charge my devices away from home, not in a car, not in another office plugged into a wall, uh, which also puts me at risk because I am disabled and would have difficulty getting away from anyone who was trying to harm me and or if I had car trouble for that matter. But these are deliberate attacks um, against my, my ability to speak out and to talk about what's happening to me. That's all. Well, I was gonna say that I experienced the same type of thing when uh, NSA was harassing me when I still worked for them. Um, basically phone calls would go to uh, bogus numbers, you know, and people would answer that it were not the usual people that I knew to be there, um, as well as the um, subject of, of uh, talking about the FOIAs that never got delivered or were uh, had their answers stolen that we uh, talked about on a previous techno crime fighter. So basically, the deep state wants you to, well, it wants to keep the facade that everything is fine and dandy, but then it wants to basically make sure you can never use your rights. You can't actually ask for a FOIA. You can't actually uh, call and talk to anybody that you really need to talk to. Um, you'll be rerouted to some bozo who tells you outrageous lies, um, and then you don't get anywhere. So um, <laughs> it's just all fraud. I mean, if you have a government says you have all these rights and then they uh, surreptitiously take them from you and obstruct you, that's just outrageous because you don't have any rights. The whole, the whole scenario is a joke, you know, and people just don't realize that. And they don't. And a lot of people basically would say, OK, well, that's your tough luck. No, it's an increasing number of people's tough luck, and it's going to come to you to bite you on the butt. And then by the time it does, will there be anybody left to help you? You've got to ask yourself that question. I mean, that was raised in World War II when people said, oh, well, it's just the Jews. Oh, well, it's just the homosexuals. Oh, well, it's just the disabled. And no, guess what? Their whole country was destroyed. How did that benefit them? You know, their selfishness destroyed their country because they wouldn't stand up for anybody. You know, so, um, yeah, retaliation is, is vicious. And I was surprised years ago to find out the military, if you told uh, anything going on there, they immediately said you were crazy. And then, of course, it's rampant throughout uh, the federal government. And the idiot Congress passed laws, and then they don't care when you say, excuse me, but this law is not particularly working. You know, they passed the no fear law saying that, you know, going to the inspector general, going to the IG, well, the um, EEO, equal employment opportunity people, that that was a protective, protected activity and you should not have your work downgraded and you should be not, you know, not punished and fired for doing so. And yet it's rampant. They do it anyway. Um, so they pass the law. And then when you tell them it's not working, they act like, well, we passed the law. What more do you want us to do? We want you to actually do something to enforce it. You know, so when they don't have the guts to do anything but pass worthless, you know, pieces of paper, um, then yes, it's going to be abused because the intelligence community and the deep state take them for the fools that they are. You know, they assess them correctly as cowards and fools and fakes. You know, so it's that's just ridiculous. And then the uh, the state and local people follow the lead from the feds. I mean, I've said this before when I was in Florida and I wrote a FOIA, which is really the equivalent, you know, FOIA for the state of Florida was um, called the um, Sunshine Act. So essentially, I wrote a Sunshine Act request to the Leon County Sheriff's Department to see if they were having contact with NSA, because I knew they were, because a deputy admitted that to me. So I wrote a rather extensive uh, uh, Freedom of Information Act type for Florida. And they said, OK, that's lovely. We have about 800 pages that may um, fit into what you're asking, but that'll be $2,000 for us to actually look through them. So they make sure that you can't possibly um, work the, um, you know, the things that they give you to find out information. They make sure that every door is closed. You know, it's just there for show. And I will say, when I first came out and spoke, um, a couple of the very first people to interview me, uh, Phil Marie with his um, Wheel of um, Freedom show, and uh, John Lucazana with his, I think it's Guns, Love, and and 
guns, I'm sorry, guns, love, and freedom. I, I don't remember quite. But they both were re immediately retaliated against, you know. And Phil Marie actually was, um, I mean, he's, he's, you know, they both are talking about things that are uh, the deep state don't want them to. But uh, Phil Marie almost lost his life later. You know, he had to be uh, hospitalized. And it was touch and go there. It was very serious. And then John Lucasana had to go out into the Arizona um, desert, you know, off grid to get away from some of, some of the vicious harassment he was being put through for daring to interview me. So these people are petty um, psychopaths. They're just, they're insane, you know, and people say, well, you know, I think they hit me harder last night because I, you know, ate a peanut butter sandwich. You know, and then they may think, well, they, you know, uh, they hit me less because I ate a peanut butter sandwich. And I say, you know, you can't figure these people out because they're just mean. They're just they're it, It's a snake. It's going to bite you. And you can't figure out why the snake bit you. It just bit you because it's a snake, you know, but these people just are incredibly petty. They really are, you know. So we have to decide, are we going to do we want to stay under their knuckle, under their boot? you know, um, and then try to uh, play it quiet and, and hope they don't hurt us as badly today, you know, as they did yesterday. Or do we say, okay, you know what, we're going to take a bit more of this punishment because we're going to fight back and we're going to teach them that the worse they are to us, the more we talk, the more we speak out, the more we're active. Now, there are some people who don't have that luxury, and I am not calling them out. If you have a child or you're trying to work and keep your job, keep your, keep your head above water, then you do so and you make sure that you survive. You make sure you keep that income coming in and you survive as best you can because there are people who can fight back better than you can and don't worry about it, you know, and, and we will and we can. So, you know, let everybody just, your first job is survive, okay? I mean, I think I speak from the entire techno um, crew here. Your first duty is survive. And if you can do more, wonderful. But if not, we want you there when we stomp these people into the ground. So you make sure you survive. So you be careful and you be smart. And that's my, that's my comment right now. Um, I think, um, you know, as far as the retaliation goes, um, I mean, um, you know, there has been shocking retaliation here in Switzerland as well. I have received a phone call from Siegfried Thomas that um, he and another German victim wanted to go um, and talk to the, um, um, it's a German radio station in Germany. It's called the Westdeutsche Rundfunk. So the West German, uh, uh, you know, broadcasting agency, West German mind, not East German, but uh, it might have been just as well have been East German because um, what they did is they actually went to the building and uh, the German, this, the other German victim said that in the olden days, you could just go in and talk to um, a journalist. And now they were barred. They were not allowed to go and talk to a journalist. And apparently um, the reason was is that there has been some sort of terrorist attack. I mean, that is ludicrous. I'm not sure if there's anybody left in the, on the planet who doesn't know that all the terrorist attacks are staged by the secret services. Any terrorist attack in Germany is staged by the BND together with the CIA, together with the cartel. You know, it's like some piffling nonsense. So for, you know, the West German broadcaster not to know that uh, is, of course, absolutely, you know, not believable. So what actually is happening is that now the, the I will talk more about what phase we're in and what we're actually dealing with. But ultimately, we have in all of our societies a massive, the biggest organized crime cartel in history that has been with us for not just millennia, but tens and perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, because it's a structure, it's a system. And systems outlive individual, you know, uh, system nodes, if you like, or people in this case, in the case of human systems. But we have, what I'm trying to get across to everybody is we are dealing with exactly the same crime cartel. It doesn't matter if you're in Washington DC, if you're in Tokyo, or if you're in Zurich or in Berlin, it's exactly the same network. 
So the, the control architecture at the top is the same, their, their means of communication is the same, and they're doing everywhere around the world the same sort of stuff. So, you know, in Paris, we had the, the fake Charlie Hebdo um, shooting. In London, we had 7-7, which was totally fake from and his entire book written about that. Then we had 9-11, which was also organized by this crime cartel. And it's fake, 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 fake. It's the same organized crime cartel committing genocide around the world, which is what they've been doing for a long time. Um, but now what they also did is with the money that they've stolen, they have bought all the media organizations. So the VDA are rejecting um, two victims who are reporting genocide in Germany means that the VDA is entirely in deep capture by organized crime. They answer to organized crime. They, do, they are not answerable to the German people. But this means that the chiefs of the VDR are committing high treason. And uh, the actual laws within Germany, this is actually one thing I want to say. Sorry, just a brief note on Germany. Um, it turns out, and uh, people more versed in the law than me, have discovered that actually the laws of occupation in Germany have never been lifted. In other words, um, these laws that have been passed after the Second World War, these little newspaper things, are still valid. Okay, so everything that is happened in Germany, the basic law is layered on top of that, but the very first sentence says, none of this touches previous obligations and laws. In other words, Germany is still under occupation. Okay, now under occupation by whom? At first one would say, okay, it's under occupation by the allies, but that's nonsense. They are under occupation by this organized crime cartel. Okay, so the organized crime cartel has infiltrated these, uh, you know, these government organizations and especially the secret services and is putting absolutely the entire world under its own capture. Now, the reason why that is important is because if you want to, you know, Karen was saying, what on earth are we going to do? Well, what we need to do is we need to recapture the media organizations. So um, I'm just waiting for the evidence to come in from Siegfried Thomas and his friend. And then we need to bring criminal charges against the, um, the leaders of the Westdeutsche Rundfunk for basically co-conspiring to cover up crimes against humanity for the German people. And one of the things that's not um, said here is that actually the, the, um, the, the German Reich, the last one, the German Reich before the Nazis came, is I think the last valid uh, legal structure for Germany under international law. But those laws still apply to the territory. So these people have committed high treason under the ancient laws of Germany. And if we're lucky, the death penalty might apply. I, I like the death penalty for these people. But um, what is really, really important is that we all need to think, okay, what Siegfried Thomas and his colleague are doing in Germany, we need to repeat absolutely in every single country because the pattern is the same. The pattern of deep capture is the same and the pattern of recapture is the same. So it doesn't matter if you're in Tokyo or if you're in Washington DC, what you need to do is you need to put together victim cases. You need to approach it with well-documented victim cases. You need to approach the media. And when they refuse to report about crimes against humanity, you charge them with core conspiracy to cover up crimes against humanity. That's, that's the mechanism. And we need to get all the names of these, um, the top media leaders. And then it's just like a machine. It's like, um, you know, clockwork. You go in as a group of uh, victims, you know, hands this in and you don't even need that bigger group. I think five people would be totally enough. You know, if you can get 10, easy. So every victim organization around the world needs to start feeding these victim cases to the media organizations. And if they refuse or if they smear these people as mentally ill, they are covering up crimes against humanity. And this means the entire editorship, the CEOs and all the top, they are in court automatically. And we need to get them out so that the next batch can move up. And then if they refuse, we get them out. So this is this is how we have to recycle the system. So this is the background in Germany. I encourage everybody to read uh, this book. Sorry, this is in German. It says, uh, wussten Sie, dass das Besatzung, Besatzungsrecht in Deutschland immer noch gilt? So in, in English, did you know that occupation law still applies in Germany? In other words, Germany is still under occupation. And um, it was written by uh, Peter Frühwald. Okay, you can buy this on Amazon. And there's a second copy of this, very important. By the way, this also tallies with what the um, former head of Austrian intelligence has said, which is that um, um, German secret services are being run 
by um, the uh, the Anglo-Americans, so by the um, NSA and by GCHQ. This is what, uh, what's his name? Polly said, whatever his first name is, I keep forgetting. So this tallies, okay? But then you can say, yeah, but isn't it the Americans doing it to us? It's And what you have to understand is it's, it's not the Americans. The Americans is just as screwed as we are. What this is, it's an organized crime network, okay? And this is how we all have to think um, around the world. Now, the story with Siegfried Thomas and his um, the other German victim is that they went to the VDR on or WDR in, uh, on Monday, and on Tuesday, the German victim was hospitalized because of the attacks on him. So it happened on German territory. So the first one in line for that, the, the person who's authorized this, is Dr. Bruno Karl, head of the BND, okay? or the, the head of the Verfassungsschutz, which is Marsen, they are both guilty. They are both guilty. So with that case, immediately, it goes into the criminal charges against these Nazis, you know? And I think this is what we have to do. So for every vit victim case, we're now literally, you know, um, starting to, to work faster and faster. For every victim case, we need to start putting in together the what happened, when did it happen, was it cor correlated so that it can be shown that it's uh, very likely retaliation, and then who the hell was in charge. And whoever the hell was in charge is up in court, you know? And, and this is what we should do. So it's Marson and, and Carl for um, the case um, with Siegfried Thomas and, and his, um, the other victim. And um, for every case in the US, we need to start doing the same. And with every retaliation, we're just clawing more and more at them, you know? And I'd like to add, um, Catherine, on that note, bringing it to the US, you know, one of the things that we know recently is uh, someone who is um, a very prominent human rights advocate in our midst, Dr. Ed Spencer was recently hospitalized just last night, um, you know, directly after he started talking about working with us to, um, to set up scanning sessions over here in the US for those people who are reporting being uh, non-consensually covertly implanted with RFID chips. Um, we do need scanning sessions. We need radiologists. We need university uh, studios, labs, technicians to come to our help. We need, um, you know, medical professionals. We need radiologists to actually enter the system, enter the scenario and actually step forward and act with some spine when people in the community are reporting being non-consensually implanted. We need our medical professionals to act like medical professionals with a spine, with some guts, with some integrity, and actually offer them some scanning services, you know? subject these people who are reporting victims to MRIs, to um, nuclear MRIs, to ultrasounds, to x-rays, whatever, you know, medical system is in place to actually scan and detect implants in the human body. I mean, at this point in time, implants are like a thriving industry in this country. They are a thriving medical industry. NIH uses them copiously. You know, all of the, the clinics are using them. They're using them at the level of the body for diabetes monitoring, for instance. They're using them in the brain for Parkinson's monitoring and so forth. So neuro implants, bodily implants, body area networks, this is part of the medical scene currently. You know, so clearly doctors know how they're implanted. Doctors know how they can be detected. We need doctors to step forward and show some courage here and show some humanity and show some human rights advocacy and act for these human rights victims. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, Dr. Ed Spence and I have been recently talking about. And we were talking about how we can go about trying to set up scanning sessions for, you know, reporting human rights victims of these non-consensual covert implantation crimes in the US. The kind of thing that Melanie Richen and um, other people working in ACOTOR have been setting up in Belgium you know, and have been very successful at currently, because a certain Belgian university has stepped forward with some very compassionate and aware and smart doctors stepping forward to um, offer to do the scanning. So we need that kind of thing in the US. In any case, no sooner does uh, Dr. Spencer talk about this, than you know, he's hit very badly. And all of a sudden he's in an ambulance, he's in the ER, um, he's got a medical emergency, and uh, we're all hoping and praying for his safety 
and his health at this point in time. But, you know, that is an intense attack that he suffered. And the question becomes, well, why is he suffering this attack? Now, the other thing Dr. Spencer was uh, supporting and endorsing was a 10-step checklist that I recently have put out there. And I'm hoping to get endorsements from other doctors and psychiatrists. And I'm hoping to make this a campaign um, with the GIT team or, and with doctors. So, um, and it's all about educating doctors and psychiatrists and giving them a heads up about all of these things that we are talking about. Non-consensual COVID implantation with RFID chips, directed energy weapons testing on people, not, that is most definitely being carried out all across the country and across the world, in fact, and non-consensual neuroexperimentation, which is being carried out by the super dark agencies, DARPA, the CIA, the DIA, the FBI, because you know the DOD is involved in this. So the FBI, DOD, CIA, DIA, um, Army intelligence of various kinds, Marine Corps intelligence, U.S. Navy, uh, apparently the U.S. Navy and Navy, Navy intelligence is primary in all of this stuff because they were some of the early progenitors of directed energy weapons te uh, technologies so, and newer technologies. So all of these dark agencies running dark experiments um, and actually co-opting communities. And that brings me to the issue of what's happening in our communities. So um, before I lose my train of thought, did I finish my sentence over there about um, all of these dark agencies and all of those weapons testing, et cetera? So um, that, oh, right, the heads up to the doctors and psychiatrists. Let me just finish that. So what we're trying to do currently is start this campaign to educate doctors and psychiatrists about the horrendous reality of what is going on over here and how therefore they need to step forward as engaged professionals, as thoughtful, mentally aware, insane, and educated professionals. They need to step forward because the kind of things that are being done to those people who are being put under surveillance in our communities is absolutely horrendous. It's off the scale, ridiculous, outrageous, extreme, barbaric, torturous, you name it. It's inhumane. What's being done to those who are targeted and those who are being non-consensually experimented on is inhumane. And literally every one of us who's educated in society needs to step up and start speaking out and start taking action. Because if we do not take action for this minority, well, at this point, we can call them a minority, them or us a minority, those of us who are being targeted and uber surveilled and extrajudicially surveilled. But this minority, as Karen just um, talked about, is in increasing in number and is going to increase in number. Because think about it, wasn't this exactly how those Germans, how those Nazis pulled it off? They started hitting, you know, a small batch of people, a minority. They hit the Polish, they hit the Jews, they hit the gypsies. And then before you know it, there's thousands of people thrown into concentration camps, disappeared off the face of the earth, gassed, you know, led off the boat, off the train into the gas chamber by Mengele and co. You know, isn't that what happened? So unfortunately, we are seeing totalitarian fascism being rolled up today. We are seeing the Fourth Reich. I believe that was the third Reich, right? And Germany, the Nazis. And now this is apparently the fourth Reich because- Exactly. As, right? And as many people tell us, historians tell us, Jim Mars and, um, you know, the, those who study the Project Paperclip uh, projects, etc. apparently the Nazis never lost the war. They were just voted to safety in the US, happily ensconced inside the secret agencies, moved from the mind control experiments in Germany, to the new mind control exper experiments in the USA and Canada and elsewhere. Um, NK Ultra flourished and apparently continues to flourish and has now become neuro ex experimentation 101, or maybe we should say 701, because it's really advanced. Uh, so <laughs> um, the Nazis never went away. And um, even if they did go underground for a little while, they resurfaced. They're in our midst and they're running Nazi and communist operations in our midst in our communities today. So Absolutely. educated professionals need to wake up and you know take action. And that's what that 10 step checklist to educate doctors and psychiatrists is all about. How people really insanely should react, not shout out mental illness, force commit, force medicate, you know, rush them to the psych ward. These people who talk about implants are mentally ill. These people who talk about surveillance are mentally ill. Excuse me, surveillance has become ridiculous you know, currently. You don't make surveillance go away by saying mentally ill when somebody reports uber surveillance. You begin to examine what's being talked about. That's the same response. 
So anyway, that's the campaign and that will be, you know, that's going to become a campaign and we'll bring it out properly shortly. Um, the thing about communities, coming to the level of community, recently I published an article um, that Gerald republished an article that Gerald Sosky had written about how communities are being co-opted. And he talks about federal magistrate judges and how the FBI is using corrupt federal magistrate judges, how the FBI really is ruling the roost over here. They've got the power over these judges. You know, they literally pay the judges. The, the judge's salary depends upon the FBI, apparently. It's not the other way around. So anyway, so the FBI gets these judges to pull up to uh, write out these court authorizations and court orders for thousands of people that are put wrongfully under surveillance, wrongfully labeled as terrorists. I mean, that's the fashion of the day. It's been the fad of the day for about eight, 20 years now, ever since 2001 and 9-11. Um, um, puts out these false court orders waves them about to the neighbors, tells everyone this person is under investigation for whatever, most probably terrorism, but whatever else, who knows, drug trafficking, child pornography, you name it, because the, the Fed likes to project its own crimes and others, and um, the FBI rather. And um, doing that gains the collusion of the neighborhood and the silence and the complicity of the neighborhood. So that everybody then proceeds to treat the target as a criminal. And who are these targets? Well, we've gone over that a hundred times. Those who are targeted are people who are outstanding, people who are natural born leaders, people who are community activists, people of spine and integrity, people who speak out against corruption. These are the people who are being targeted, being named extremist troublemakers and terrorists by the FBI. And, you know, being retaliated against and defamed and slandered. The first step in enrolling people into these non-consensual experimentation projects is to defame, slander, libel them so that they can be dismissed and discredited when they speak out and they say, I am being hit with electromagnetic weapons. I am being hit with electrical energy that's being laid remotely on my body from a bit. I am being hit. As soon as somebody says I'm being hit, they've got the dismissal slander campaign in place and they've got the mentally ill label in place. So they've got their colluding psychiatrists, their colluding law enforcement to charge in, arrest people, force commit people. So this has to be pulled out at the root. We need to attack this BS of the mentally ill label and we need to attack the wrongfulness of this court order protocol where the FBI is able to do this and wave around court orders. Now, of course, the other part of it is the FISA court and the NSL, the National Security Letter, because that's also in operation. I think both of these, from what I can tell, both of these appear to be in operation. Some people they're calling foreign terrorists. These are the people who make phone calls to their fathers and mothers in Poland and Czechoslovakia and England and India and so on and so forth. Um, I most probably have, been, have come under that. Uh, because, you know, I call my father in India. I call my friends in India. I call my cousins in India. So uh, that must make me a terrorist, right? Because uh, we love to get together and talk about our gardens. Yes, we are such terrorists. Um, so just a second, Roland. I think your audio is being messed with. Um, I'm, I suspect it's Millicent's microphone because Millicent's microphone, the muting has gone off, but I don't think she did that. And from there I get blasted with, um, I'm not sure. May yeah, now it's gone. I think I just uh, muted Millicent's mic from here. No, now I can now I cannot hear a thing. And I think what was happening is that background um, hiss was being pumped, but it was not coming from Millicent. That was actually pumped down the that channel. So I it's see. again. I couldn't hear um, it. You know, I can't hear what's going on really. Um, but thank you for telling me that. So that um, yeah, I'm almost done. I'll just um, unmute Millicent in just a second, Millicent. It's uh, obviously not against you. It's just the mic sound. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, you know, um, that's what we need to do. We need to attack this at the root, I think. We need to question these um, false court orders and we need to question this um, wrongful behavior of the FBI in doing this and uh, the wrongful behavior of fusion centers in targeting people and issuing these wrongful national security letters against them. Because as we all know at this point in time, just as you said earlier, Catherine, Everybody who doesn't understand that these terrorist operations are all set up by the secret agencies 
has uh, seriously got some brain cells seriously damaged by these chemtrails and uh, probably needs to detox. So um, we are all being targeted with the chemtrails, as we all know, and brain damage is another issue that we should talk about today. But uh, moving on and coming back to this, uh, this scenario of the communities, literally our neighbors and people in our communities need to understand that the people running these operations are running thug operations in our neighborhoods. They're running gang and mafia operations. They're literally setting up the entire neighborhood to target somebody. And going, doing this year after year, month after month, and how stupid are the people in the neighborhoods that they are just falling in and going for it and continuing to target and attack and surveil and monitor and cell phone track and um, permit people to park in their driveways and permit people to zoom up and down the streets, et cetera. Why would our neighbors do that, you know? And it comes back to that fear of the intelligence agencies, fear of the surveillance state, fear of the FBI, you know? And they think this is a proper fear and a legitimate fear. And as Karen said, we need to wake up and break people out of that trance, you know? Because Actually, who yeah. are these people who are doing this? I'm sorry, Catherine. Go no, ahead. no, no, no. I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. You raised a really good point. I just, I was sitting on the edge of my seat as you were saying that because I used to think that these people are misguided, but the more I see the faces, I realize, no, they are enjoying it. The truth is that the vast majority of the population is just that abjectly evil. They are scum. Yes. I think, you know what? Honest people are rare and this degenerate vermin are abundant. And I was thinking about it really hard. Sorry, I just get knocking from Karen's microphone, I think. I, um, you know what, I was thinking about it and I'm thinking right now from a systems an analysis point of view, we, have, we are now seeing the world as it is after two world wars. And I'm actually thinking, and I'm going to make the thesis later on that these two world wars were staged by this organized crime network to asset strip the good people and to murder them in concentration camps. And they murdered millions. They murdered millions in Germany. They murdered millions actually, you know, in Europe, outside of Germany. They murdered millions in communist Russia, in communist China. And these were utter scum and thugs who were murdering. And right now I can see the murdering happening in Romania today by the criminals who got themselves into power, who are connected to the secret services, who are connected to MI6, and they are exterminating the German and the Hungarian population. That evidence will be in my court case. Who are these people? Anybody who would do that is just utter thuggish scum, the vermin of society. But you know what? After two world wars and killing off millions and doing actually the same thing in Vietnam, in Latin America, in Africa, I think the good and honest people, their breed has been really uh, rarefied. And what we're now seeing is a population where the most thuggish criminal Nazi families have just, you know, stayed and festered and bred and spread their utterly degenerate culture. You know, I mean, Germany is toxic because they had, first of all, they established the Nazi networks and then they had the bloody Eastern European Stasi networks, which were never actually thinned, never exposed. And now we have this Nazi Stasi family empires running thug operations, not paying any tax, having beneficial tax um, operation according to the tax law of Germany. Anybody who is a snitch only pays 10% tax. And that's actually in their standard um, you know, tax book. Um, and, and I think this is what we're seeing. We are actually seeing uh, our society after the selection. And then the same organized crime cartel that had, you know, has organized Nazism and communism after rebranding has now rebranded it to, you know, Satanism and it's the Illuminati and they're putting out all the stuff about the Illuminati and hey, how cool is it to join? And I think it's the same churn, the same revolution happening over and over where this organized crime franchise is just spreading throughout the world and killing off all the honest people. Uh, because when I look at my own neighborhood, I, as I was just writing my court case, listing all the criminals who revealed themselves to me around me, there's barely anybody honest left, you know? I've, and, and one of the things I can say is the people downstairs, they weren't afraid when they screened their head off at me and called me all sorts of names. And meanwhile, the guy downstairs is a lorry driver. He's a freaking lorry driver. And he tells me, you know, 
what to do and his wife's getting upset about oh my god i didn't take down the laundry in time and that's why she has to have a screaming fit while i'm you know trying to save lives these people are proletarians and they have been recruited by this organized network so i think what we are seeing now all around us in our communities is the dictatorship of the proletariat and proles actually originally they say oh it's working class people oh no 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 anybody who's been to a communist country knows the proletariat is not just the working class people it can be educated people when they are criminally corrupt when they are just what you would call scum the scum of the earth oxford had people who were scum of the earth and they were highly educated a middle class and upper middle class but i think this is what we're now um seeing oh dear i've just seen that um uh that Ramola has left. I hope she can make it back in. But um, you know, until she comes back, I just wanted to very briefly say um, like two things. We have to do two or three things um, to really start fighting back against this. Number one, we have to really put into order what has been done to us. Okay, so that's step number one. So the evidence chain has to be just watertight. The second thing is that we need to identify who they are. So people still to this day keep referring to they. What I want the entire community to start doing is I mean the head of the FBI. I mean Gina Haspel, you know, the head of the CIA. I mean so-and-so, the head of my local, um, you know, police. I want names people. So we all start referring to names. Who was in charge? Who is the Nazi? Who has authorized this? So this is step number two. And then step number three is to really start acting and getting them out. And um, my experience with these court cases is that um, the judges are, have been corrupted. A lot of the judges are members of this criminal network. For example, our Lord Sumption, I believe, is a member of this criminal network based on my own witness statement and my own evidence and what he's done to uh, Stuart Suvery in, uh, in Jersey, the senator in Jersey, and so on. So, there are Supreme Court judges who are members of this criminal network. For example, Scalia, I believe to have been a, a member of this criminal network. And now when we have this, we have to think, okay, in a situation of deep capture, how does one get rid of a Supreme Court judge? You know, what's the mechanism? What's the administrative mechanism? How does one get rid of a corrupt judge? What's the mechanism? How many cases do we have to get together to say this guy's corrupt? Because we need to do it for the victim cases, but we also need to do it for the cases of child kidnap in the families, which is rife. So I think in the UK, a thousand children are stolen or kidnapped from their parents per month. Okay? 120,000 children being kidnapped per year. Where are they going? Where are they going? And that's not counting the, the children going missing. So that's, a, that's the tip of the iceberg of a massive, massive, um, you know, criminal operation that we're seeing. So these parts have to come together. And my, I'm happy to announce, I'm happy to announce that after a half a year wait, the uh, affidavit template is now finished. So it's finished and I haven't published it today because I'm still spell checking and I'm getting the formatting right. But there are no more changes, no more comments will be taken in. It's finished people. So um, I'm just tidying it up. I didn't get to finish it today, but I'm tidying it up. And then we start collecting all the evidence and putting it together. I was just keeping an eye on the chat today and um, Targeted um, Ireland or Targeted in Ireland said that um, two, or two lawyers rejected um, the affidavit given to them. Now, what I would say to that is you write down the name of those lawyers because they either, you know, are members of this criminal crime cartel or they're being blackmailed by this criminal crime cartel and in court they can tell us which of the two they fall into you know but we need the names we now now we're in this phase we need names 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 the names of journalists who reject you the names of lawyers who reject you especially the names of police officers who haven't done anything and that actually in the case of millicent is chief um tim potts and and captain Troy Potts. i think we are members of this criminal network and um, Troy Potts actually lied to me. He lied. He said that um, he hasn't seen Millicent's case and he didn't know that I'm getting Millicent's emails that is sent to him every two days. And I, I saw a month's worth of it. So he lied to me about a serious case. So he must be one of the criminals. So all of these things we need to put together. And then when we have these, these three elements, we need to start. It's like a steam engine, okay? We have now the moving parts, bits and pieces. We built the wheels, we built the steering, and so on. But we now need to get the engine rolling. 
And it's literally like a, like a steam engine. So we need to have this cycle of filling out an affidavit, handing it to lawyers, collecting the names of corrupt lawyers, handing it to the police, collecting the names of corrupt police, and then going into court with it. And should it be rejected, collecting the names of corrupt judges as well. And we don't stop there. We keep cycling. And the cases do not stop. Okay, and this is why I actually encourage you, screw the lawyers, you know, because if they are this corrupt, it means that they will ensure that you will lose your case. Like I previously feared with the, the, um, the lawyer that Frederick Laroche, uh, you know, kicked out last week. You know what, you can, you can lose a case for free by yourself. You don't need a corrupt lawyer, you know. And for example, when I went to the, to the high court um, in London in 2016, there was, um, uh, what was her name? Miss Aaron. And Mr. Green, there for MI6 and MI5 and GCHQ. Well, Miss Aaron lied to the court, pretending that the Philip Kerr case was just about, oh, you know, an odd sock was placed into his gym bag and the sofa was shifted. This is what they said in their skeleton arguments, ignoring that it was about MI5 kidnapping the man, drugging him. His girlfriend confessed that she drugged him because MI5 pressured her and so on and so on. It's about 13 years of, you know, crimes against humanity, not about a gym bag and a shifted sofa. So she lied. She actually, you know, he, <laughs> you know, perverted the course of justice. And she put it in writing that stupid little thing, you know. And then there was Mr. Green, who also knew what was going on, right? Because he was talking to his, uh, you know, learned friend, Miss Aaron. And he condoned these lies. And then it was very interesting in the, in the, before the court case, um, he said to me, oh, have I tried the bar pro bono unit? And I said, yes, but they rejected me. And he said, yes, I sometimes work for the bar pro bono unit. At which point I thought, okay, <laughs> well, I most certainly don't need the services of a man like Mr. Green, you know? No, thank you very much, you know? Because these people are actually a liability. And um, I think bit by bit, we'll try to, we'll start to understand that the Bar Association has been set up by the crime cartel as well. And what it actually is, it's a cartel. It is actually a front also by this organized crime network. Want to certify criminal from the organized crime network? I'm not sure. You know? Catherine, can you hear me? Yes. For those who, who have taken that affidavit though to a lawyer and been rejected, they need to ask, what do they require? What does the lawyer require as in an affidavit so that we'll know how to adjust it if possible? Yes, I agree. I agree. In my case, I've, I've talked to dozens of lawyers. Um, they just told me they cannot help me and they didn't say anything further. They actually refused to comment on the case further. That that was my experience. So if that happens, I think you should you should keep pushing the lawyer. And what's most important, please record all the conversations you have with the lawyers, because uh, you know record them covertly if necessary. Because these are crimes against humanity. You know, we have to prove just how corrupt they are and how much they are blocking. You know, I would like to comment on, on a couple of things that Ramola was talking about. She was talking about the fact that the uh, FBI may be contacting our neighbors and even our family members and telling them that they're, they are, are, have launched an investigation. I found out in 2005, what they don't tell them is that the investigation is not supposed to end until we're dead. So that means absolutely it is a fraudulent operation because then they're not trying to solve a crime it, we are actually in a terminal experiment. That's all it can be. That's all it can be. That's correct. So then the persons, our loved ones, our family members, uh, even our church members can never tell us what they know, which then also puts them in a double bind and also in an emotional tailspin, especially mm -hmm. as they see the, the torture increase. I remember showing someone very close to me um, an outline of what this quote unquote investigation looks like. And she was just breathtaking. She said, oh, that's cruel because they don't tell them what they're going to actually do to us. I asked the nurse, I approached her in the library one day. I said, if the government came and asked if they could use your child in an experiment that they wouldn't hurt him, but they just needed your approval. I said, would you give it? She says, no, because they never tell the truth. 
This is someone in the healthcare profession. She knew that they never tell the truth. I was actually interviewed by a researcher at a, at a, a major university medical center once for a position and he was doing, um, well, I guess I won't call the kind of research, but it became obvious that there was gonna be some non-disclosure involved. And so I said to him, look, I'm a Christian and I can't be involved in anything that's not gonna be totally upfront and above board with the, you know, with the, uh, with the patient. And he says, well, I can't hire you. So it's going on. And speaking of our uh, complaints and displeasure about law enforcement's failure to investigate our uh, pleas for help, I do have a change.org petition out there that's been out there for a month now. It's called law, uh, Lawmakers Investigate Law Enforcement Agencies That Ignore the Pleas of Victims of Domestic Abuse. Uh, right now, I've got mm, going on 400 signatures. Would love to have those of you who have not to go out, take a look at that petition. If you agree with it, sign it and pass it on to your friends. Actually, may I show people how to get there? So either you search for that, um, you know, by yourself, or if you're if you want a link, um, I actually put up a link to all the petitions um, that exist. Um, if I may just um, share my screen. Um, so the petition that um, Millicent was talking about, if you go to stop W7 under how you can help here on the right hand side, top right, there is um, sign the current petitions here in blue. And the top one is Millicent's new petition here. This was investigate law enforcement agencies that ignore the pleas of victims of domestic abuse. If you click on that, you can, uh, you can sign this here. And um, also, you know, once you sign one, it's so easy to sign them all. So I, I encourage you to have the whole, uh, at the whole list and sign them all if you like, you know. And if there are any new petitions, please let me know so that I can include them in here. Sorry, I just wanted to show people where they can go. No problem, thank you. And one other thing I'd like to add, while we were talking about the means by which we are being surveilled and even assaulted, uh, for those of you who don't know, you can go to a website called antennasearch.com, put in your street address, and it will bring up the uh, cell towers and the antennas within a four mile radius of you. I strongly encourage you to take a look at the uh, um, the list that's going to be provided and it will be provided in a an Excel spreadsheet or a spreadsheet format. Take a look at the at the the owners' um, names. There may be some that you'll recognize, but we have certainly found some uh, interesting information by doing that antenna search. You may have antennas and and uh, cell towers, G within feet of you, and they can be used for assault. Absolutely. I think this is a really good idea. I also would like to say that um, when I um, did the antenna search, one of the problems I had is that um, the website is sometimes blocked. So it looks like the website doesn't exist. Um, but in actual fact, um, you know, it's there, you're just being blocked. So then one of the things you can use, um, actually, in general, that's very good advice, I found, download the tour browser, and just, um, you know, reroute uh, the actual path that, um, you know, that you take. So if you, if you, if you just search for the Onion browser, the Tor browser, um, you can find out what it is, and then you just hit a button, you hit the Onion symbol, and then you just, you know, pick another path. Um, and then suddenly websites that seem to be blocked reappear magically and work flawlessly. So that is one thing uh, that still, in, in many cases, works around these stupid hacks, you know. I am being attacked by a fly. This, no, seriously, this is warfare. <laughs> I've been sitting here ever since we've been talking and nothing, and the minute I started talking about there being a experiment versus a real investigation. And you know what? Actually, a federal investigator told me that. He confirmed it. He said, it's not a real investigation. He said, because if it was, I would, would have been through in three days. And a police officer uh, down in Jackson told me the same thing. So they do know that these are not real investigations. These are actually terminal, inve terminal experiments. 
they're, I would say they're not even, they're not experiments because everything that they do, they can do it with surgical precision. These are not experiments. What, what we are being used by, um, for, this is my best assessment, is our bodies are being used to train up armies, but I'm really saying armies because, you know, in, in Oxford, the people stalking me, a bunch of old bankers, but here it's a lot of young people we're talking people in their late teens, actually sometimes mid-teens and early 20s. This is exactly the soldier age. These people are being trained up to be a 21st century oh, Nazi oh. warfare machinery, you know? Brown shirts. On every single body, every single victim around us. And somebody said it in the chat, actually, that they are training, if they are being used as training centers. That's right. I can confirm it by looking out of my window and seeing a never ending stream of young people go to the same buildings under the black goat, for example. Absolutely. And yes, these are, these are terminal programs. These, this is a Holocaust, you know, we're not meant to survive. But what the people who don't support us don't understand is that we are the battle line. If they don't support us, these armies are there to on and just spread they swarm they will swarm and they are swarming already through the u.s and switzerland you know and the ultimate targets are the biggest pots of money so here in zurich i can see why the the ndb is training up these death squads because zurich has all these multi-millionaires from the banking industry you know absolutely i'm sorry miss. i get a lot of uh, noise from your microphone and um we can't mute it. I think Karen wanted to say something and I just cut her off. I'll, I'll mute it. That's okay. Um, I was going to point out when people think about the fact that they know some of their neighbors who are participating in this, but they're like, well, I'm not involved, so I'm just going to ignore it. Um, in Greenwood Hills in Tallahassee, Florida, when the assaults with the energy weapons started on me and my elderly parents, there were weekends that I knew that in the nighttime they would be rolling out especially nasty weapons. And that's because the main four families that were conducting these attacks from their property and they were being paid to do so because every single one of them was seen receiving goods and services, which are usually under the table. But I came quickly to learn that as soon as I saw these key four families pack up and leave for the weekend, that other people were going to be coming in with trucks, with pickup trucks, with vans, and they would be having larger machinery on their uh, vehicles to hit our house with. Now, why in the world would these four families leave unless they knew that what was being hit um, what, what we were being hit with and therefore what the entire neighborhood was being hit with was extraordinarily dangerous. And I will tell you when these, um, when these machines were used on us in the middle of the night, they did something very strange to the ionization of the air. And that makes me wonder if it was ionized radiation. And that's why these people left the neighborhood. So your dear neighbors for money your dear neighbors for money are very glad to not only radiate the people that they're targeting, but they are happy to radiate you in their neighborhood. Exactly. I'm, I'm pleased that Ramola is back. We were, we were in a small panic when, when you left Ramola. <laughs> But it's, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Karen. And also, um, one of the things is I do have this uh, Geiger counter here. And um, what you can do, if this is expensive, guys, you know, so maybe it's not the first thing you should get. But once you have it, you, if you set the alarm, you know, to a certain threshold, which I would set at 0.6 or maybe 1.5, you know, microsievert per hour, you can actually see how every 20 to 30 minutes your house is being hit by, in, in this case, it used to be between 80 and 90 microsievert per hour. And um, now that I put the shielding up, suddenly it gets punching through at 110, 120. This is now radioactivity. So clearly they, you know, up the ante when the shielding was put around me. So I think what I'm, I'm observing here is, is some sort of x-ray surveillance where they literally just blast my house with x-rays and they just x-ray everything. They x-ray my body. So I'm getting a chest x-ray every, uh, every half an hour. 
from these people. You know, it's about 800 times ambient radio radioactivity that's blasted at first. I mean, there's something called, um, you know, cosmic rays. So from the cosmos, you can be hit. Planet Earth is being hit nonstop with, you know, ionizing radiation. And for example, the particle detector at, um, at DAISY, when we were eight floors below ground, we had these showers, these cosmic showers where the entire, you know, the detector lit up all the calorimeters were just like boom you know full of energy and there was no beam in the pipe so what the hell was that well this was um cosmic radiation and we could see it was coming from above you know and um so that exists but cosmic radiation has a distribution of energies it's not so finely tuned and it most certainly doesn't tune the energy depending on have you put up shielding or not so um, all the people who can afford a Geiger counter like that, I really encourage you do that and just film it, you know, put it on your table next to you and just with a webcam film it or take screenshots every single time it goes above a, um, a certain threshold because this, this one beeps and then just see what the value is when it goes above, I would say 1.5 micros even power, you know, just see, do you see it roughly the same values over and over? And if so, my money is on x-ray surveillance. Yeah, although I don't know anything about the technology, but you know, I have, I can have an edu educated guess how it works, you know. So I missed a great deal of this conversation, but I heard little snippets. You know, I think my laptop has suddenly drained a battery, and I looked down and I found it actually wasn't plugged in. So I'm lucky to get back in actually. <laughs> so I plugged it in and I called the Zoom guys as to find out how on earth to get back in because I found out that your you know everything is fine on YouTube. It was continuing, the webinar was continuing, but I just couldn't get in. But anyway, he showed me, and so I know now how to do it in case it happens again. So, oh, um, actually, on on the when you mentioned the, the you know being locked out, I've just had I just remembered something which I just would like to announce very very briefly, which is um, I would like to share my screen and uh, draw people's attention, especially in the U.S., to a case in Britain that I've now, um, you know, got involved with. I wanted to get involved with a long time ago, but now I did. Um, under court cases, you will find a new tab down here for Melanie Shaw. Now, she is um, a child abuse whistleblower, you know, in the U.K., and she has been, I would say, I mean, set up um, in one of some a weird entrapment operation. And she has been locked up in solitary confinement. I would almost, uh, you know, fear for two years. And uh, she had all sorts done to her in, in the prison. And now somebody notified me and told me that apparently she was to be released on the 2nd of June and still hasn't been released. Now on this page for Melanie Shaw, you can find my phone call to, this, to the prison and you can find this uh, letter correspondence and the second letter, I have to post it, but the second letter is basically a, a copy and paste of the first. And it says, so one of the things, so what I asked them is I wanted to be told, um, you know, first of all, it is for my court case because I'm, I'm going to quote this one, um, you know, as an example, because I think Melanie Shaw is, is a victim of MI5, you know, um, because I believe that MI5 are running child abuse, the, the trafficking networks in the UK. So, um, I, this is why this is relevant. So I wanted to ask, uh, you know, is Melanie Shaw still held at that prison? And can you confirm that her release date was the 2nd of June? Was or is she being held in solitary confinement on which day uh, was she first admitted? And who was the judge, uh, especially this question, who's, uh, um, on whose orders she was imprisoned? And can you please send me a copy of the judgment? I would really need this information as quickly as possible. Apparently this information is private. I don't agree with that. These are just parameters about the, uh, you know, the capture and the imprisonment of a British national. I think the public has a right to know. I really think every single question we have a right to know. But most certainly, I think the public has got the right to hear about the judgment. And this is a touchy topic because I was told that people were not given the judgment. It was a secret court with a secret, you know, judgment. Uh, and for secret, always replace criminal. So it was a criminal court with a criminal judgment. And that's why I'm after this. But um, the, the um, you know, the uh, prison replied and they said, uh, we are unable to provide any information unless the prisoner has provided signed authority confirming we can release her details. You know, any requests we would need to be on a formal letterhead with the required signed authority attached, which you would need to obtain. So I, I said to them, can you please give my email to Melanie Shaw and she can sign it, you know, then and there. 
but uh, they refuse. So I have to now write to Melanie, which again, eats up days, but I will do so. And I, I will want to find out, um, you know, um, what's happening with her. And if, if anybody knows, or, you know, is actually there when um, uh, Melanie Shaw is released, please give her my, my email. This is one, my request to the community, please, if you can get through to Melanie Shaw, give her my email when she's being released, because I want to talk to her. I think she needs our support. So, sorry, that's just a quick announcement about, um, you know, an ongoing case. Um, I think it's, and it's important again, because whatever happened to Melanie Shaw, the secret court business, is exactly what we saw in uh, Switzerland as well, with the secret court, and in Britain. You know, yeah, no, that's an excellent point that you're highlighting Melanie's case. You know, John Wedger, I think, had posted something recently on Twitter highlighting her case. And um, apparently she got into prison, she got arrested just because she was exposing the pedo trafficking and the pedophilia among the politicians, you know, in Britain. So um, hers is actually a very interesting case. I would like to pursue it myself and find out more and speak to Melanie if at all possible. I mean, I don't know how long she's stuck in jail for. So um, John Ledger may be the person to contact on that. Yeah, I, I really should. And maybe I should get, uh, because John Ledger is also, I mean, former police and he's in the UK, maybe he can help me. But it's um, extremely important. And also Melanie Shaw has been in, in, I think, in prison for two years now. And one of the things I, I really would like to press home to somebody, this is actually a general point, okay? So it doesn't matter if they use this prison system or if they use psychiatry, what they are, what they are, gaming at what they're playing at is that they think they can just make up any old nonsense and smear people with it and they keep doing it over and over and over and they think they can get away with it but at some point no they cannot and you don't even need to know about the details of the case to get these bastards because you can simply use the rules of statistics so the probability to become an absolutely like you know mind-blowing whistleblower about child abuse and then the probability for, to you, for you to turn from hyper uber integrity, like one in a million sort of six sigma sort of integrity to such a vile criminal that you would need to be not just in prison for two years, but in solitary confinement. We're not even the worst terrorists in the UK, you know, on, in solitary confinement for two years. Well, the probability for that is absolutely jack all. But the probability for MI5 be, being a bunch of total criminals is pretty much 100%. You know, I so it's like that's it. And the same with psychiatry, you know, for example, the Frederick LaRoche case. What is the probability that, you know, you are a person of high integrity, you've been campaigning for years against crimes against humanity, you send 3,000 emails to the French parliament, and suddenly within a week of having sent those emails, you know, actually lobbying parliament to, to stop crimes against humanity, you turn into a driving maniac, you know, so bad that you, you basically stick out in France. And as far as I can tell, having lived in France, France consists of driving maniacs, you know? So what sort of traffic offense would you have to commit to just offend a French police officer? I don't know. So this is nonsense. It's just like the statistics don't hold up. And this is again, very, very important also when it comes to targeted murders. For example, when I went to the um, headquarters of the military uh, the military headquarters and the, the headquarters of the secret service in uh, Switzerland, when I went to Bern into this den hole of self-loving idiot serial killers, the guy I talked to, this narcissistic moron, you know, he actually was kind enough to threaten me to my face. And he said, you know, when he said, oh, but, you know, I, I see so many cases like yours, you know, people, when, when it gets really foggy here in Bern, you know, they, people get extremely depressed, like me, he implied. And it was beautiful sunshine and I was just to do, 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 you know, like this. So this was a death threat. And then what he said, trying to be, you know, threatening, you know, although he was just a limp-wristed little shit, was that he said to me, oh, you know, things things happen all the time you know people get heart attacks car accidents they just die and this was meant to be a death threat so then he was saying to me look we can kill you in a car accident you can have a heart attack you can have this you can have a stroke you can have a brain aneurysm and i was just thinking yeah granddad could be but the laws of statistics means that this cannot be it absolutely cannot be for me in the next year or two years whilst i'm, ca I'm campaigning against you to have a brain aneurysm by my own good self is pretty much zero, you know? So no, the laws of statistics, more and more, the more crap you do, the clearer the case. 
you know, and, and this is wonderful because one of the things I can confirm is that neither doctors, most certainly not psychiatrists, and as it seems not even intelligence agencies, know the laws of statistics. And this is how we get them. We get them with science, you know, because all we need to do is put all these cases together and based on just like, you know, uh, a, a rough qualitative assessment of these cases, I can 100% say that we can show retaliation with directed energy weapons as soon as people try to protect themselves. That's when they get hit. And the data shows it clear as day. And then it doesn't matter if they give you, I don't know what, a brain aneurysm or heart attack. The only thing that matters is correlation with what actually went before you know, and correlation with what these scumbags are doing around the world, you know, so it is not true. Do not ever let yourself be told that you can be killed and it doesn't leave traces. No, it does. It does. And it leaves traces in the statistics. And these are absolutely unmistakable traces. And that's exactly what science uses. That's what I, that was my day job finding signals like that. And I'm one of the things I can tell you is when you're using modern statistics, you can find the needle in the haystack. That's what I did for my PhD. You know, I managed to pick out, I think 48 events out of quadrillions. And I managed to measure, actually measure a physical process. So all I have to do now is look at many, many cases and measure the criminality of MI5 and NDB. And I, I swear, I can do that. We can all do that. And I'll teach you all how to do it, you know? So that, that is how we get these people. Sorry, I got very angry and I got carried away. Sorry for talking to me. No, no, that's very useful information. I mean, obviously the retaliation is so extreme in all of these cases, in Melanie Shaw's case, in Frederick LaRoche's case, in Barbara Hartwell's case. You know, I just got a post on my website currently asking people to support my ongoing podcast series with Barbara Hartwell, who's a CIA whistleblower, and uh, who has been incredibly slandered, incredibly defamed, incredibly persecuted. She's living in absolute poverty. And she's somebody who is a senior citizen. She's disabled. She has barely any you know, dis disability benefits. I think it's a laugh um, when she shared with me the amount that she gets on disability and the amount that she pays for rent. She literally has no money to live on. And um, so, uh, my question really is, in this country, you know, in the U.S., how could somebody treat someone like that? Um, Barbara Hartwell worked for the CIA for 25 years. She's not pulling a pension from the CIA. Immediately after she left, and she says, actually, it was very difficult to leave the CIA. They don't let you leave the CIA, you know? So it took forever for her to actually break free and get away. But after she got away, my God, you know, the retaliation has been extreme. They literally destroyed her life. She, could, she lost her house. She had to live in a motel for a long period of time. She was chased, stalked, not surveilled or monitored. She was chased, stalked. And she was hit with incredible car accidents, which left her disabled, you know. And... Um, on top of that, she couldn't get employment. She was blacklisted everywhere. A massive slander and defamation campaign was unleashed on her to the extent that her name, she says, became Mud. And in one of our podcasts, she actually shows me and takes me through the very many places and people who have slandered and defamed her and the kind of YouTube videos they have put up and the kind of stuff they are saying about her. And she actually refutes each and every one of these uh, slander and defamation campaigns. So... Now, she's somebody who is a very forthright speaker and a journalist. And if you look at her website, she's, she speaks her mind. But she's also laying bare the bones, the skeletal understructure of the entire COINTELPRO operation of modern times that, you know, we have become very familiar with, but that she was examining in relation to whistleblowers, other whistleblowers from the CIA, from the FBI, from the LAPD, and so on. Uh, who were also subjected to extreme retaliation. So this notion of the persecution of whistleblowers has become a national tradition in the US. And my question really is, well, when are you people going to, when is humanity, when are the people of the United States going to rise up and say no more to this? This is absolute abuse. It's absolute abuse and persecution that somebody's life could be taken down to such an extent, blacklisted, unable to get a job, blackballed, unable to get rent anywhere because her name's been so defamed, you know, unable to, to find a landlord who could look her up on the internet, find out who she is, and then immediately say, uh, oh, I'll give you a place to stay. Most usually they say they look up her name on the internet, 
and say, sorry, we can't, um, you know, we can't have anything to do with you. Your name is associated with child pornography. Your name is associated with this, that, and the other. You know, so that's the kind of extreme slander and defamation, just like Melanie Shaw faced, that uh, so many other people are facing. Um, Gerald Sosby also has faced. In fact, he's just recently been writing to me about how he's been impersonated on Facebook after having been kicked off Facebook by Facebook. Now somebody has put his name on there and started up a new ID for him. And some woman has, you know, defamed him saying, this Gerald Sosby is doing this and doing that and using my photographs and posting under my name, et cetera, et cetera. So he just informed me this morning that he's once again tried to join Facebook merely in order to combat the slander and defamation that's being directed at him. But look at the amount of work that people have to go to, you know, the extent that whistleblowers have to go to in order to protect their reputation because it's so easily slandered and defamed by this group of thugs that you know, let loose on the populace. You know? I'm, I'm thinking now that we're talking about retaliation on this episode, we should think about how to retaliate as well. And I'm thinking the only way to win this war is if we retaliate in a way that sticks much harder than they could ever retaliate. So in, the, in the case of, um, you know, Gerald Sosby and the many, many others who have been uh, barred from social media, I would, I would recommend the following. Number one, anybody who's opening an account online anywhere has got a trace an ip address and non-stop communication to that platform so it's very very simple because you know one computer needs to connect to the other the machines know what's connecting to what they have to otherwise the packets don't travel you know don't arrive so there's a clear trail who owns this entire you know architecture oh well it's intel my goodness it's those people who have to actually fight terrorism well all, only thing we have to do is get the evidence for this i mean i i love it when they put stuff into writing like that because it actually connects one device to the other somebody needs to own that device you know so we have the criminal and this is how you have to think thank god somebody impersonated me on facebook because now i've got the evidence just screenshot it print to pdf on your browser get the evidence back it up burn it to cd actually anything that's small enough to burn to cd or blu-ray is great because you engrave it into material it's physical you know you can't just delete it that easily you have to destroy the cd and then you think okay how can i get these bastards and how many bastards can i get with this you know so with Facebook, I think you can request the entire list of IP addresses who might have accessed your, um, your uh, account, number one, if you have anybody hacking your account. If anybody impersonates you, you can request um, the IP addresses. And if even if Facebook doesn't give it to you, say the information here will be subject to litigation, please hold on to it and don't let, it, don't let the log files be deleted. You know, we, I will request this. If you don't give it to me, I request it by court order, you know, and, and make sure that the evidence is secured. And any instance of impersonation is valuable evidence. The other thing is death threats or veiled threats or just um, psychological warfare from trolls. Um, take a screenshot of the Twitter messages uh, and click on the message so that the actual tweet number is shown in the URL and then screenshot that with the message, the username and the tweet ID, because that's again, evidence for court. Again, a person or a bot network owned by a person somewhere needs to have posted that. And again, we have people. So now we need to retaliate against these guys. You know? But Gerald also said to me that, you know, this kind of impersonation is cybercrime would come under what Millicent was talking about earlier, which is cybercrime. And you can report it to the FCC, he says. So that's another means of reporting such crime, you know. So the kind of retaliation you're talking about, obviously, Catherine, it's not really retaliation, but um, it's a very powerful response to to challenge and terminate, you know, such extreme retaliation that is being launched against us and against whistleblowers, right? I mean, because obviously what you're trying to do is stop them from retaliating. I mean, talking about retaliation, I should tell you what happened to me last weekend. You know, I'd like to actually share my screen and show you this article that I published. Um, 
while you're bringing up, let me just get in a half sentence. I know yeah. I do mean retaliation. I'm still looking for death penalties. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. I, I, this is like first day. Throwing them in jail or whatever. Yes, ab absolutely. We would like some just prosecution of these criminals, you know, and unfortunately, there are so many thousands of them sitting inside these uh, hundreds of intelligence agencies. I don't know how you prosecute a whole lot of them, but they really need prosecution. So this article, by the way, that I published on Steemit last, I think Thursday or Friday, I forget. Normalized captivity of leading whistleblower journalist has helped expand humanity's consciousness. As you can tell, it's about Julian Assange. It's about his captivity in the embassy, in uh, the Ecuadorian embassy in London. And it's about re relaying really the conversations that a few journalists had um, as part of the Unity for J vigil, you know, and those are fabulous conversations. I keep telling everyone, please go listen to them. They're all on YouTube. Um, look on Susie Dawson's uh, channel. You'll find them all over there. And this particular article, as soon as I published it, which by the way, I was really prevented from writing, posting, you, uh, you know, putting Markdown on it because it's written in Markdown, which is Aaron Schwartz's um, uh, you know, markdown text, it's an HTML for um, text for the internet, a very simple form of uh, webizing text for the internet. So as I was trying to, you know, do all this, I was massively thwarted, massively cyber hacked, massively cyber stopped, my computer frozen constantly. So something that should have taken, you know, literally 40 minutes, took 15 hours. And I stayed up like nights trying to finish this and post this one single article. It really shouldn't have taken that long. Certainly the writing of it took a little long and I won't go into that, but you know, just trying to post it took forever. And then after I posted it for four days, I was massively hit, okay? I was massively hit with directed energy weapons. And um, I'll stop sharing at this point because I just want to talk a little bit about what happened. For four days, I was hit with microwave pulse shots to the left side of my brain. I was hit at home. I was hit walking outside in the neighborhood. I was hit walking in a local park. I was hit while driving. And you have to ask yourself, how is that possible? Well, it's possible if you can imagine cell towers being used to direct pulse shots at somebody, you know, in a very targeted fashion. It's possible if you can imagine satellites being triangulated around somebody and being directed to hit someone. So this is what happened. For four days, I was hit so extremely. I had a massive migraine. It really thwarted all of my other work that I was striving to do over the past four days. And I was totally laid low. And I have to think, what exactly happened? Now, as people know who read my work and who watch my podcast pretty much every day, I am writing an article exposing the criminality. Pretty much every day I'm doing a podcast with somebody who is exposing the criminality of what is going on in our communities. You know, so gone are the days when I would think to myself, oh, I did this and therefore this happened. Literally every single thing I do as a journalist is causing retaliation. And sometimes it causes extreme retaliation. So this is why I wanted to mention the Julian Assange article, as everybody knows, Julian Assange is still trapped in that embassy. He cannot step out because if he steps out, the British police is waiting to arrest him instead of letting him go catch a plane and go to Ecuador because Ecuador has granted him asylum. So that is the rightful thing to do. The British government is behaving in the most criminal fashion by preventing his egress from that embassy. So in a sense, he's being held in captivity by the British government. And then you have the US government waiting for the British government to extradite him so that they can arrest him, throw him in jail, possibly condemn him to the same kind of punishment that Chelsea Manning received. You know, solitary confinement, torture in confinement, etc., etc. So to a person who has received asylum from a foreign country, which is now apparently reneging on its deals and uh, engaging in kind of a communications shutdown for Julian. Apparently, and this is something Jeff Gordon reported at the actual protest on the 19th of June, which was the uh, sixth anniversary of Julian Assange's arriving at the Ecuadorian embassy, where there were massive vigils and protests in front of the embassy. Julian did not come out. Julian did not come out to say hello. So Julian is being held in extreme confinement. He's being isolated. There have been rumors that he's ill. It would be a tragedy, and this is something that the people at Unity4J 
discussed, it would be a tragedy. It would be in, in a situation of martyrdom if Julian Assange died in captivity. You know, this is something that should wake everybody up in the world. What's being done to Julian Assange is, is kind of setting a precedent for everybody, not just journalists. It's, uh, you know, a sign of a, an attack on free speech, an attack on journalism, an attack on leading edge journalism, you know, of the kind that WikiLeaks and Julian Assange practices. But it's also an attack on humanity's consciousness because WikiLeaks has helped us see the world in different ways. You know, thanks to the documents that WikiLeaks has published to the world, we all know a great deal more about what these secret agencies are doing. We all know a great deal more about what the military is doing and how actual soldiers in the military are operating, as we all noticed and saw from the collateral murder video, right? We saw the criminality in action. We could not have seen that criminality without WikiLeaks. Yeah, and I would say that um, what he did um, it was to uncover and help, help to uncover and help to prosecute crimes against humanity because um, I'm quoting some of the documents in those um, wiki, you know. The famous one was, for example, the, uh, the 1,000, 1,400, 1,500 victim cases sent to Stratford or between Stratford and employees um, already in 2007, 10 years ago. So I would have never ever, you know, gotten that uh, that information, and that's a real handle on these organisations that they know about crimes against humanity. So I think, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not just um what he did is not just rightful. Um, what you could say that this is what was necessary to save humanity, and whoever is blocking the uncovering of crimes against humanity is guilty of covering them up. You know, certainly conspiring, co-conspiring to covering them up. So those are criminals. So I would say now we need to find out whose responsibility it is that Julian Assange can't have a um, safe passage, you know, to, to Ecuador. And we need to bring criminal, criminal charges against those people, you know. That's exactly right, Catherine. We are talking about criminals, criminal behavior and criminal acts. Um, and, you know, Susie Dawson also made this uh, remark and this this point in one of her conversations at the Unity 4J vigil, that basically what WikiLeaks has opened us up to is information that we should have, we should know as humanity when crimes against humanity are being committed anywhere in the world, you know, whether it's in situations of war or in situations of not war, because the kind of crimes that you're talking about, Catherine, that list of a thousand names, etc., which came, I think, from John Finch in Australia, right? Um, and that points to those who are being extrajudicially targeted, et cetera, that, it, that was recorded in WikiLeaks and that is now public information for everybody to take a hold of, to, to take notice of and to speak out about. That information was um, released to the world via WikiLeaks in a kind of public acknowledgement of targeting, the kind of public acknowledgement that mainstream media still has not given any sign of. The only way they mention targeting is when they write these pithy little uh, popcorn pieces about mentally ill people coming along and mentioning implants and saying they're stalked and surveilled, etc., which are total attempts to deny, dismiss the very credible and meaningful reportage of those reporting victims of these particular crimes, these targeting crimes, these surveillance crimes, these non-consensual experimentation crimes, and these weapons testing crimes. So what WikiLeaks did there was astounding. And um, so the point that Susie was making was that the information that WikiLeaks and Julian have given to the world is information that rightfully belongs to the world, the same point that you are making. It's information that belongs to us. If one of us is being tortured and targeted, the rest of us need to know, you know? And this is really what this particular broadcast is all about. Humanity needs to know that there are thousands actually millions of people who are being targeted around the world with deadly weaponry and they are being tortured, they are being persecuted. And when they speak out, they are retaliated against. Whistleblowers who speak out about any aspect of this are extremely retaliated against. Journalists who write or speak out about any aspect of this are retaliated against, you know, to, to an extreme. So this kind of extremity of abuse, I mean, I was literally abused the last four days with these microwave assaults. This was massive and extreme abuse. This was unpardonable abuse. And I know, Catherine, you've also suffered extreme abuse. This is abuse, this is persecution, this is torture. 
this is unconscionable. This is unacceptable. It's untenable. I don't care who you are. If you are an, a person in an intelligence agency, I don't care if you are the head of the FBI or the head of the CIA, you know, like Christopher Ray or Gina Haspel, you have no right to put your signature to a program that permits the torture and persecution of even one person, let alone thousands or millions. Mm -hmm. And that real, unfortunately is what's been done. Yeah, I think the real problem is that um, Gina Haskell, for example, I really think she's a psychopathic degenerate. These people have entire bits missing in their head that they're not even human. So they don't care if what's written on a piece of paper far away from where they are. They are psychopathic serial killers. They're psychopathic serial killers. Randall Webster doesn't care about the constitution. Gina Haspel doesn't care about the constitution and there are scores of others. And now the question is what mechanism do we have? And we have traditionally the police and the courts who can go to the courts, make it all public what's happening and get an immediate court order, which would say that the judge says immediately to the police, I want this person arrested now. And then the machinery gets going. Now, when the police don't you know, investigate when you're telling them, your last refuge is the judge. Now, when, and this is now I'm, I'm telling people, this is, this is the last stand, okay? So now as the system is moving towards the court cases, I will do my utmost to channel it through the court cases because I think this is the only way the system can recover safely. Anything else will be a civil war crash. But should the judges delay or not give the victims right, and should the judges not issue arrest warrants against the key criminals, what we have is the judges are basically blocking the system. It's almost like we have a crashing plane. The pilot is there, would like to get to the steering wheel and pull it up, and the judge says, no, you can't. Well, if it's clear what to do in a plane situation, you take the judge and you strangle him, you know, break his neck, something because one dead judge is better than a, an entire plane of people dying. Now, I don't advocate violence, but people have to, and especially judges, especially the corrupt ones, right? The corrupt Supreme Court judges that have known to exist, they need to be absolutely understanding that should they block victims any further, the only thing for civil society to do is to actually start using violence to save their own life. And this is going back to natural justice. You are allowed to kill to protect your own life. You actually are. And that's what, funnily enough, the cartel does. The cartel kills people, okay? I, in my family, people were murdered, okay? So when they come to me and I have seen the evidence of my grandparents having been murdered and they try to murder me, do I have a right to murder them, right? I mean, if I die, then again, another person of integrity dies. And this is repeated everywhere around the country, you know? Well, it's an issue of self-defense, I think, what? right? It's an issue of self-defense, right? And it, I know it, that there are- self-defense, but on, on this, the thing is with this situation now, and this is why I'm not, I'm not advocating violence, but, but at some point when you have literally the next generation, the children being mass murdered because we have slaughter factories, and a judge is not willing to arrest the criminals, can you remove the judge? Yes, if he's not willing or cannot be removed, can a, can a society remove him by force? Oh yeah, because when this happens, MI6 did what they're doing now in Britain with, um, with uh, Romania. And what they did is they put criminal judges in and criminal police, poli police officers until the system depleted with criminals. Now, when you have criminals and they are blocking the system, Romania just crashed, like millions of people lost their livelihood. Would it have been okay to remove those judges, jail them, and maybe have citizen arrests? Of course, this is what should have been done. You know, would those citizen arrests have been murdered before they could actually trial the judge? Oh yes, of course. So in that situation, would the Romanian people have been allowed to murder the judge so that even if they get murdered, at least one judge gets removed? Yes, of course. You know, and, and this situation leads to an all out civil war shootout situation. So what I'm saying is exactly, I don't want this. So I don't want, as soon as you start seeing dead judges, it means the system is trying to repair itself in the most brutal, but also the fastest way possible. So the reason why I really say this is because I'm really urging all these lawyers to start helping us to have civilized court cases because the court cases are the last stand. That is literally the last platform we have in civil society 
where we can have our cases heard, the chemtrails, you know, the nanobots, the spraying of nanobots, the nanotechnology, the brain chipping of children, you know, the brain chipping of everybody. If they block us like they have blocked people for the last 20 years, the only strategy is to get rid of the judges and the police officers as quickly as possible and then have proper tribunals. But I really don't want that. What I really want is to have normal civil society laws and actually, you know, get these people and, and ideally death penalties for the criminals, you know. But uh, I don't think judges understand. So here, for example, in the case of Siegfried Thomas, just to update you, I just spoke to Siegfried Thomas, as I said, and I said, have you heard anything from the judge? And he said, no, she's now delaying things. Delaying tactics. And meanwhile, Siegfried Thomas and especially his wife are being slaughtered by the Swiss military. Like what? At some point, when this, if the Swiss actually understood how much radiation hits them in every canton, in every community, you know, if the judges are not willing to actually say, okay, I think the, the head of the military needs to be arrested, somebody in the canton needs to shoot him the fuck down. Like this is literally, this is a military situation, you know? And now the question is, can the judge in the Siegfried Thomas case wrap her little head around this fact that if she doesn't move, and we keep being irradiated, and especially, as I've just seen today again, the Swiss military is training up hundreds of thousands of young people to murder the Swiss in their own home. And every day we get delayed by these judges, more and more thousands of little serial killers are being spawned. That's the reality, guys. These gang stalkers, they're not just there to stalk, they're there to kill. They're ganging up to kill, right? Nobody. So they're death squads. Hmm? They're death squads. Yes. And I would interject just two points right here. John F. Kennedy said that if, if basically a uh, peaceful revolution is kept from happening, then that makes violent revolution inevitable. And, and another uh, concept that I just ran into is legal necessity. Legal necessity basically defends someone who committed a crime to prevent a bigger crime. Let's say you're walking through the parking lot, it's uh, 90 degrees out and you walk past a car where there is a child or a dog inside and they're dying because it's not 90 degrees inside of the car, it's 120 degrees inside the car. So you smash the window to open the door to get the dog or the child out and to save their life. Well, you just committed a crime. Okay, you broke someone's window, that's vandalism. But according to legal necessity, you were forced to do it in order to prevent a worse crime, which is death by negligence of the person who left that child or that dog inside the car. Well, they are pushing people to uh, legal necessity. You know, they're saying, oh, well, you know, these three or four neighbors in the, in the neighborhood irradiating you, they haven't killed you yet, but when they do, we'll look into it. No, I think we have a right to do something about it before we're in the morgue. So the police and the judges and everybody else, they're pushing us toward that. So they need to know that. And they need to be notified uh, of that, you know. So, I mean, <laughs> I think maybe we can't do it with our names, but anonymously maybe writing a letter that outlines this might be a good thing, you know, and naming the perpetrators and say, you know, you're giving me the choice of dying or committing a crime, you know, because you won't do your jobs. Exactly. And in fact, Karen, you know what I think? I'm, I'm going to put my name to it. I'm going to make exactly this case next time I'm standing up before a judge because I've seen now, I've, I've just seen corrupt court cases. I haven't seen a single court case of integrity. And I'm going to say, well, I know I have seen actually, you know, Judge Spencer was okay. You know, Judge Edith, he was okay. They did the right thing. You know, as far as I can tell, certainly Judge Spencer, no problem at all. Judge Holgate, I rather suspect he's in on this. You know, he was rather cheerful. But if I, I'm ever standing up before Judge Holgate type ever again, I will actually put this in writing because this is a fact. This is a, this is a systems physics fact that we now stand here between the choice of protecting the life of judges and police officers who we have evidence that they are members of a criminal network against hundreds and thousands, actually over the, the entire planet, millions of children who are being murdered. Now, the children are innocent. The judges aren't. Should we kill, let or let be killed, you know, a million children or instead kill a bunch of corrupt judges to get rid of them? Well, <laughs> 
I, the question doesn't even arise. You know, I have to interject over here, Catherine. You know, I understand what you're saying, and I hear what Karen is saying as well. And I do think certain messages do need to be given to police officers, to the FBI, to these people who are, uh, you know, occupying positions of authority in our societies. Uh, I think messages, very stern messages, need to be you know, given to them that they cannot do this and get away with it because they are set. They've set up the scenario just to force people to either commit a crime, they are provoking people. It's all about parallel construction. Throw people on a terrorist watch list or an extremist watch list and then provoke them extremely on the roadways, provoke them in their homes with extreme directed energy weapons attacks or with neuro weapon attacks, provoke them extremely and then stand back and laugh when they commit a crime such as lashing out and whacking somebody on the roadway who drives into them or something like that, who knows. But that's what they're hoping for. They're looking for, you know, they call it self-incrimination, right? It's parallel construction, harassment and provocation, and then self-incrimination by the target. That's their plan, that's their protocol, that they think they've got it going and it's great. But um, I think people need to let them know that we can see through it. We see this program of action. It's all false, it's all wrong, and it needs to be stopped. We need to send across a very stern message. I don't know if the right message is to merely say that judges and police officers are going to be killed because frankly, it's not just judges and police officers. It's not just a handful. It's the whole system. They are part of a system. I mean, we've talked incessantly about the whole Masonic secret society aspect of this, right? These judges are part of secret societies. They've, they engage in secret handshakes with each other. You know, a wink and a nod and a cigar in the good old boys club. And, they, and, they're going, and that's how they get away with it. They are actually committing crimes in public. In well, it's sedition. It's sedition. When you take over a country and you say nobody in our club is going to be able to be given the rights that the country says they have under the Constitution, we're going to make sure that only we get those rights and we're going to conspire to, not, to deny rights to anybody we just don't like. You know, they think they have equal protection under the law? No. We're going to deny them that. They think that self-defense is good? No. We're going to say that it's assault. You know, uh, they're just going to twist the laws and pervert them so that they, uh, pardon the language, screw over anybody who's not part of their club. And then it's a, the United States of America for the Masons, but nobody else. That's sedition. And it's sedition in any country. That's correct. It's sedition and it's high treason. They've already engaged in it, but they're still wrapped up in the shield of the badge and the shield of authority, you know, yes. the shield of secrecy and classified and national security BS. So this is how they get away with it. And this is how when people actually take them to court, the cases are thrown out of court. People are told they'd have no legal standing. Gerald Sosby's case was thrown out of court. So many people's cases have been thrown out of court. You know, you have to wonder how you can get justice in a failed system when the system is composed of good old boys, masons, corrupt people, corrupt secret society members, whose only, you know, be all and end all apparently is to, you know, jip the common person and to target the common person, make money off the common person, traffic the common person, and put the common person into parallel construction and uh, completely taken over scenarios, completely catch 22 type scenarios. So um, how do you deal with a system like that, you know? You, I don't think taking out one person or two people is going to answer for it. We are dealing with systems of extreme corruption, extreme criminality, entrenched, entrenched yeah. criminality. Well, it is. Well, one thing I would say is that we need to write something very definitive along those lines, saying you're basically leaving, uh, you know, a set of people. Let's say they're the new untouchables, you know. Um, you're leaving a set of people with no recourse, and we're notifying you of that fact, yeah. that you are perverting the justice system so that people are left with the, with the choices of either dying, being killed, yeah. or acting out. And so this is the notification that we are demanding to be allowed to defend ourselves. And if you don't do it, we will, yeah. you know, and that needs to be far, you know, spread far and wide because there is no excuse. You cannot say, I mean, look, if I walked into the police station and there was somebody following me in, hitting me every two seconds, would the policeman say, oh, yeah, I see you're being insulted. You need to go over and file this paperwork and we'll get around to bringing it to court and 
you know, I'm being hit every two seconds. If I move to the left, the guy follows and hits me. If I move to the right, the guy follows and hits me. And, and is the policeman really going to say, we need you to file a court case? You know, while the person's assaulting you nonstop? That's lunacy. It's absolutely lunacy. And that's what they're telling us. That's exactly what the, but my problem is, trying to write my, up my evidence. I cannot because I'm being assaulted and raped nonstop. I mean, as I'm sitting here, my head is being pulsed with about two shots per second. And there's nothing I can do. I don't know how the hell they're getting in. Um, absolutely. But I think what's also important is that I have to say, um, none of these loan shooters, you can tell it was a CIA and an Intel setup, you know, FBI, CIA, whatever, you know, alphabet suit setup, because these idiots, they are just, you know, supposedly mowing people down randomly. Well, that's not good. But what's really good is to mow down the head of Intel, because that sets a sign. Literally, that really sets a sign, because that's what the mafia does. The mafia works day to day with psychopaths, so they... But we're not the mafia. You see, this is the thing. We are defenseless members of humanity. We are not armed combatants. Okay? But, well, we are not armed combatants. But the thing is also, for example, I hear week on week on Twitter and on everyone in the media, how not just the Americans, but, you know, many other nations around the world are insisting on their gun rights. And I say, oh, that's really quaint. But what's the, what's the point when you're going to use them? It's like, oh, yeah, I want to use my gun when a burglar comes in. Well, it's not going to be a burglar, my friend. It's going to be an ADS system so far away. You can't even Maybe shoot that far. What the hell are you going to do then, my friend? Well, what you need to do is before the ADS comes, you need to send a, an ultimatum to people like Gina Haspel and say, look, my dear, unless the torture of the Americans stops literally by mid midday, by the time you leave your office, at home, you are an outlaw, and whoever guns you the F down on your way home will actually get a prize. That person gets $50,000 in cash. How about that? And let's see how quickly it changes. And you put out, literally, you, and the U.S. has experience with that, having most wanted, you know, signals and a literal, little prize, crowdfunding for these most, you know, how can we get $10,000 together for Hitman? You know, and say, unless the murdering of Americans stops by these criminals by midday, you know, you can make a phone call. Then if it's not finished by midday, by the time you leave your office, you're dead. And we're going to shoot down any plane that approaches this. And we're going to find all the, you know, underground tunnels leading there. And we're starting to drill our way through. And we're going to take the entire building out. How about that? I'm sure, okay. I'm sure it can be stopped like that. But nevertheless, the, the whistleblowing of... A, a federal investigator or multiple federal investigators or multiple NSA agents or multiple military commission officers has not changed anything. So our threats, they're not afraid of our, th our threats and there's but no need in making them. It's not, you know, I mean, the whistleblower testimony is an affidavit written down on paper, filed somewhere really far away. Oh, I mean, they're not, pay they're not scared of paper. They're not even if you just, you know, rolled it up in a bowl and threw it at their head. They're not scared of that. So an affidavit is not going to scare a psychopath. The only thing that scares a psychopath, as the mafia tells us, is the death of that psychopath. So if we say, you know, but then we become one of them. Hmm? Well, then, but then we become one of them. And, and that, who cares? I mean, the thing is, am, am I, I willing? Am it I questioning my question? My but you know what, Melissa, it's right. so short-sighted because by me saying, oh, I'm so holier than thou and I'm not going to kill, but if I'm not doing anything, I know and I can literally mathematically prove that there must be hundreds of thousands of children being just slaughtered. So I'm like, sorry, kids, I just want to look clean. So I'm not going to kill the killer. I'm not because then I'm like them. I'm like, oh, sure. Hey, kids, tell me which one guy, you know, what did he look like? Okay, here it goes. Boom. Another one. Yeah, okay, boom, you know. If well, the okay, you become let me done. jump in here for just a second. I hear both of you, and you know, I can see the merit in both of these arguments. Frankly, the, the scenario you outlined, Catherine, would, uh, you know, that, that, that is the kind of language that they seem to understand, apparently, you know. It's like mutual threats. That's what they respond to among the, among the mafia cartels that they belong to. But as Millicent says, we are not mafia. And um, I personally think that it's, it's good to have a public debate of this nature because it puts this information out in the public space. And what it, what it actually establishes without a shadow of a doubt is that these crimes that we are speaking about are indeed going on. 
they're going on and they're affecting vast swaths of humanity, thousands of people. And who is committing these crimes? The intelligence agencies and the militaries are committing these crimes. The fusion centers are committing these crimes. Law enforcement is committing these crimes and they are co-opting communities. Our neighbors are committing these crimes. So, you know, this whole question of how do you address it? I think more and more people need to wake up to what's going on. Creating the kind of notification that you are talking about creating yeah. the kind of notification that there will be serious repercussions if, if these crimes are not immediately stopped. I think that is important. That is very important. You know, the one thing Karen mentioned was, you know, you actually have to, you, you try to notify people, right? You try to notify the police. They do nothing. You notify Congress. They do nothing. And then we find out, as we are all finding out today, that what's going on is pedo trafficking and control files on each one of these politicians that every single senator in Congress has got a control file on him because he was photographed having sex with a child. Can you believe that? Can anybody even wrap their mind around this depravity? But that apparently is what's holding them silent. So all of this needs to become public knowledge. Everybody needs to be talking about it. I think there needs to be a notification just like you did with the types of weapons being used on us. There needs to be another notification that says we do have the right to self-defense. We have begged. We have gone to every single authority. We have presented our cases. We have been blown off. We have been minimalized, you know, and we have uh, told people even what uh, authorities to go to to prove what it is that we're talking about. And they choose to ignore us. In fact, like the Leon County Sheriff's Department, when I was trying to get them to help, they had a unit that was for dangerous devices. They had a unit that was for Homeland Security. Did they pass my concerns to either of these units in a year's time? No. Gross negligence. Gross premeditated negligence. So I'm saying we need yet another declaration, I think, to be made public So that if anybody did find himself or herself in a situation where they had to do something, that this was public notification months before that happened. They were warned, you know, just like you take out an ad in the paper and you say, if my neighbor does not have this dog quit pooping in my yard, I'm going to shoot the dog. You know, then if that happens, then you have said, look, this was in the the paper for 17 weekends in a row, you know. The person was warned and they failed to do this. You know, I, you know, I would never shoot somebody's dog for that. But I'm just saying that's an example that people put things in the paper to warn other people, do not do this or I will be forced to act. And that's what we do. We write a declaration based on law, based on the self-defense as any, anyone's right in any part of the world. But in this country, there is legal necessity and this fits legal necessity. You know, if your neighbor's murdering you with a device inside the house and you choose to go inside the house and take it from him, well, that's burglary. But it should be covered by legal necessity if you really feel like if you don't do it that night, you're dead. You know, now that's not what I'm advocating. What I would prefer to see is that this is um, basically sent out as notification to people. This is what's going on. You're putting us in a position of dying we're being forced to do something we don't want to do. And then put that out there for legal protection to any, for anybody that is put into a horrible situation. Yeah, I guess uh, one of the things I would like to add before anybody misunderstands and what I want them to do is start going gunning down gang stalkers. No, 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 no. What I'm really advocating um, is because I'm already, I have to say, I'm horrified. I've now watched so many court cases and most of them were corrupt. I'm really worrying and we're running out of time. In terms of the system, we are running out of time. You can't just pull up the system anytime, just like with the plane. It will go into a tailspin, you know? There's a time and the time for it is right now to have to stop. And these psychopathic degenerates, because they've got bits missing in their heads, they don't know about this and they cannot be stopped. So at some point we need to stop them. And my, what I'm actually saying is that we set up, we go through the court system, all right, we give it to them, but if these judges, pull again a fast one and they can't even in these cases where you're being mutilated to death you're put into a concentration camp they find some weasley argument why it's okay or why your evidence isn't enough even though it's physically impossible for laymen to get this evidence 
But you know, unless you prove to us 50 years of classified research, we will continue raping you, shooting you in the vagina, and actually burning your rectum and shooting into your heart until you die. That is the proposition we're getting. So what I'm saying is if these judges try that one more time, we already go in prepared for this and we will say, my Lord, we have this situation. Now we can either pull this up now or as soon as I walk out of this court, or maybe I'm jailed, you know, because they have to do that, as you know, you can see with Melanie Shaw. If I am jailed, in parallel, there's a tribunal we have already set up where we will publicly announce, we'll have, you know, everything according to the common law. And if we say that this person is guilty and the police is not willing to arrest them, we will literally have a most wanted. Alive would be nice, but it's optional. And then the person can see how they're going to make their way home from the office, you know, because these people think that they might be able to go into some underground bunkers and sure, for some time they can, but eventually they'll have to refer surface. Either way, if they don't turn up at the office next day, somebody else needs to take over and we repeat the entire thing. So I would say we actually do this in parallel. We are already preparing notices of crimes against humanity of such a grave nature that the only way to recapture the system is to say, kill the head of the CIA, kill the head of the Air Force and keep killing the leadership until somebody actually takes the reins who will stop this. You know, that's what I would advocate. I just wanna make a public declaration as we have been making our, our discussions this afternoon. I have been literally being microwaved in my small and large intestines and in my pelvic area. This has been going on for an extremely long time and damage to my small intestines is indeed showing up. Um, absolutely, while I notify the chief of police, the city manager, the vice mayor, who is an African-American female, while we do right to, and that's, that has included some of you who have taken on my plight, the governor, the state attorney general, the FBI in two locations. So it's horrible to think that I could sit in my home and literally be tortured to death while no one does anything and everyone pretends that nothing is happening. But you know what? It's also happening to my 83 year old mother. Has been happening to her for at least 20 plus years. It's also happening to my 31 year old niece. So yeah, where does it stop? Who does take the responsibility to call an end to it? It doesn't, we're in a thugocracy. It's not a democracy, it's not even an oligarchy, it's a thugocracy. Thanks to technology, not kept uh, secure and developed by in, well, developed by people who are pretty smart, but then managed by juvenile perverts, you know? Yes, and those are very good questions to ask, obviously. You know, where does it stop? Because literally we are seeing our own children being targeted and assaulted. We're seeing our grandmothers and grandfathers being targeted and assaulted, our fathers and mothers being targeted and assaulted. So it's BS, it has to stop. And Catherine, I agree with you about having a tribunal in place having common law grand jury set up. We need a separate system. That is what I am seeing in the scenario. I am seeing massive corruption in this current system. The current code system is massively corrupt. I have very little faith in it. You know, I am trying to figure out how I can even attempt to use the current code system in order to sue the people who are mauling and assaulting and targeting me in my right. time. You know, I'm trying to figure that out. I don't have any faith in this current court system. It's totally corrupt. Judges oh, yeah, it's a joke. It's a big joke, you know? There's absolute, you know, handshakes behind the corner and this and that, and, and nothing is done. Cases are thrown out of court. You're told you have no standing. You're told you have no jurisdiction or whatever. So I need to figure that out. But what, what we really need is an end to this corruption. We need an end to this corruption and overthrowing of this corruption by the use of a humanitarian, meaningful, actively just parallel system of justice. And when I use the word parallel, I don't mean it in the sense that the FBI uses it. You know, they use it in a criminal way. I use the word parallel as Catherine just used it, just as a tribunal of justice and humanitarian address that we desperately need, you know, in our world today. That's what we need. 
we need a different court system. I don't know if we necessarily need to put out, you know, notices of Gina Haspel's head on the block or whatever, but, um, you know, if we, we did, I, I will do the graphics. I'll do the plans. <laughs> we need a different court system and we need to let Gina Haspel know and we need to let Christopher Ray know that they can be put on trial. They can be indicted by humanity, by those of us who can see these crimes and to whom these crimes are being done. They can be and they will be indicted. They can and will be prosecuted. They can and will be thrown into jail. For doing well, they're, they're breaking laws that exist. We don't even have to create new laws. We just have to have somebody enforce the Constitution and the constitutional laws that came from it. And we Correct. can make them each a list of these are the laws, a sampling of, of what you're breaking. You shouldn't even be holding public office. You should be arrested and, you know, sent to a tribunal. You really should because you have subverted the uh, American Constitution and you are at war with um, unarmed non-combatant civilians and you're you don't even have the guts to approach them to their face you're at secret war with them mm -hmm. you, you know you have all weapons. this yes Using electronic weapons you are doing it in secret you you're running it as stealth warfare you're running it as, as asymmetric warfare you know it is asymmetric you are using weapons on the unarmed and the innocent and the defenseless that's exactly we need to get that out in the public to them we need to you know, make our words stick. We need to have a powerful forum and a powerful tribunal to get that message across, absolutely. And also let's not forget the military because the military heads, the US Air Force heads, the US Navy heads are the ones who've said, it's okay to test weapons on Americans, Europeans, anybody you like. It's not okay. constitutional, it's not, not constitutional, constitutional and doesn't fit any any human rights treaty anywhere in the world. Human. Exactly, thank you. It is inhumane, it's barbaric, it and contravenes every single human rights treaty. And who would give a super soldier permission to select one of their former intimate partners to practice on as long as they want to? It's unbelievable. Oh, I mean, it's a, it's a gross betrayal. It's absolute treason. And you know, there are many things that we can do as humanity. And part of that I think is you do not consent to the system that permits this to happen. I'm going to mute because the phone is ringing as an obvious disruption, but you know what? I'm looking at the time. We have to wrap up in three minutes, guys. So please give, okay. uh, give your ending words. I'd like, I'd like to say something then about the fact that last week uh, I got an email from Catherine saying who can help me find cases that I can refer to. And we stumbled up on the, it, it was 11 or 13 cases of those tried in the Nuremberg trials. I have to go back and look and see who exactly was prosecuting those, those people, but we actually got the actual uh, trial documentation and the information about the arrest of them. That gives me a glimmer of hope because the Holocaust did finally come to an end. Those, at least some of those people were made to pay for their part in the torture and the terrorization and the traumatization of humanity. Um, that's important. It is important. And I would say that unlike Nuremberg, that um, about more than just the top echelon held responsible, um, it'll take years, but I think we'll have we'll end up having military style tribunals because otherwise it would take centuries to meet out justice to everybody involved in this. And uh, very clearly the top people who, uh, you know, thought this uh, perfidy up, you know, thought this total betrayal and psychopathic uh, exercise and parasitism. Um, those people need to be executed just as soon as they are tried. But I would like to see this go down to the middle managers and even to our neighbors. And when our neighbors said, oh, you know, I, you know, the government said so. I was fooled. I was only doing, doing what I told. At that point, if I were a judge, I would say, when did you not learn about the Constitution? When did you, when is it okay to be ignorant of the law, much less the constitution? And if you're gonna tell me a government entity can come to you and say that you have permission to torture and murder your neighbor for money, no, 
your excuse that the government just told me to, so I uh, just obeyed the government? No. You know, if you use that excuse with me, then I'm more likely to give you the death penalty than life in prison. So I'd like to see this meted out, the justice meted out, and I don't care if it's four or five million people that go to prison and or are executed. We cannot have that type of person in a society. You know, I just, sorry, I just killed your dog because somebody told me to. I just killed your son or your grandmother because somebody told me to. They had a badge. I couldn't do anything but, but that. Yeah, you could. It's called resist. It's called say no. It's called, I have morals, and I know what laws are, and I know what the Constitution is, and I say no. That's what it's called. So anybody giving uh, any type of tribunal that excuse, I hope they get the book thrown at them. Because I want to see every single person um, pay for this crime. Not a few of them just, uh, you know, at the top or the very obvious ones, and the rest fade into society to do yet more evil. No, I want all these people outed, period. I don't care if they get brands on their foreheads. They need to be known to society forever. I, I can just much, very much concur with what you have said. Um, I think also one of the things that I'm seeing now, um, looking just at the system, is that I think what we are faced with is, um, so networks are something extremely powerful because networks can outlive the, uh, the lifetime of any one member. And uh, the Freemasons, the FBI, the CIA, the Secret Services, they are networks. The Vatican Intelligence Agency, one of the oldest criminal networks ever, they have outlived, you know, all the individual criminals. And uh, the problem with networks is if you really want to break them up, you need to out everybody. You need to start with the super nodes and out them, but you need to start outing the branches because even if you take out the super nodes, somebody else from the, you know, branches will just reform. And these entire, I think in Germany, what we're seeing is the reforming of the Nazi and Stasi networks. They never went away, by the way. There's not much reforming to be done, but it's there. It's the same system in place. And this is what's attacking us. One of the things I wanted to say two things briefly. One of them is um, I want to emphasize uh, that I do not advocate victims starting, you know, going around killing their neighbors. No, 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 because that's not going to change anything. What I'm advocating strongly is the preparation of court cases where you out, you're, you're actually right, you can write now in this affidavit template, your perpetrators, publicly, there's a public section and confidentially, both. But I think the more you can out publicly, the better, because this document should be put out there so that people can start actually investigating these criminals from different angles as well. So this is what I'm advocating, but I will put this in writing and I will put it to the next judge I'm in front of, that if these people do not act, then you know there's only so many people like us who, who are articulate enough, not brain damaged, that we can still put together a case, have maybe the scientific qualifications. If they take me out, I mean, they took out uh, Dr. Oni Kilder, you know, and they delayed the entire process by years. And meanwhile, they killed thousands. So every single court case that's being thrown out is delaying, but this, their system of murder rolls on. So um, this is what, what I really want to say, that I'm entirely for court cases, you know. And I know that a lot of Christians are listening and I do not advocate us killing them, but I really think that to save the children, it is right to kill a criminal. In fact, at some point it becomes your duty because by just not wanting to, you actively condone and acquiesce to the, to the murder and torture to death of thousands of children. So at some point we need to act, but I think the right way to do it is to put the evidence together clearly, not have lynch mobs because they will be run by the other side, have it all the evidence there for posterity and then say, yes, this person is guilty. And yes, in the US, you still have the death penalty. And it's right that you have it to get these, these uh, psychopaths, you know, who have not behaved like humans out. So that's what I think anyway. Um, but either way, you know, I don't think any people will get the death penalty, by the way, because even if I'm barking my head off, this is a negotiation position. And the other people will say, oh, we want them free and we will meet in the middle, which will not be death penalty. But I'm trying to get them into prison for life. But if we ask for prison for life, they will get less. Do you see what I mean? So we have to go to the maximum. Now about the Nuremberg trials, there's something very important you need to know. And I pointed this out, but it was just in one of my private videos. I want to make the case here. Um, Millicent is right. I think we found the Nuremberg, a wonderful write-up with all the court documents. We have to find the link. I think we found it here in the references on the Wikipedia article for the Nuremberg trials. We have to wonderful. find it. Hey, Catherine, we've got to wrap it up because I've got to run out. Ah, okay, okay. Just yeah. one thing about the Nuremberg trials. If you look at the, the corpse of Goering here, 
you can see cartel signaling. He's got the Masonic hidden hand and the one eye closed. I, I assure you, Goering survived. Goering was not there murdered. There is that corpse of Goering picture. We don't need to see it. Ex absolutely. Goering, but you know, but Goering was also not what they were. Let's leave him to his, um, you know, to his uh, non-resting in peace, because I doubt he's yeah, resting. That's in America, probably. probably. <laughs> yeah. So in any case, you know, what I wanted to say was, we are in a war for our lives. Humanity is in a war for our lives. The militaries and intelligence agencies of the world have actually declared war on unarmed populaces. Some people know this and they are being targeted and sorted. Those who don't know it are being brainwashed and mind controlled by mainstream media and all of the masses of you know, um, frequency technologies and all of the various means of mind control that are being used on populations currently. We are in a war, it's an asymmetric war. Humanity needs to wake up and recognize that even though it looks like only a few people are being assaulted and targeted in neighborhoods, literally everybody is being assaulted and targeted. So everybody needs to wake up, get educated about this, get informed, take action, and do the kinds of things that Karen and um, you know the rest of us have been talking about, always without violence. I should, rec I should underline this show is not about recommending violence in any way, shape, or form, but about discussing any possibility openly in order to bring such egregious crimes of, against humanity to an end. So on that note, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much for watching this morning. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. And we'll be with you again next week at the same time. Thank you. Goodbye.